live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello and welcome back to Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. That is a live shot from Newport, Oregon right there from our Newport camera. And it wasn't there, but if you go further out into that ocean and just a uh, way south, there were some earthquakes that happened. You probably heard about those that happened there off the Oregon coast. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So again, I'm Greg Nibbler. Thank you for joining us. This is Fox 12 Now. We're live streaming on our social media channels, our website and our app, apps, multiple. So thank you for finding us and being a part of this. And again, we get to have a lot of conversations here on this show, but this is what we're talking about. So you probably heard about these earthquakes, some pretty big ones actually, that happened there off the Oregon coast over this last 24 hours. And we want to find out more about what's happening, why it happened, and the details behind that. And to do so, I am very thankful to have joining us right now. We have Mouse Royce from the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. And Mouse, thank you for being with us here today. I've got this kind of image that just gives a little bit of an idea of where that happened. So right down there, it looks like towards the, oops, pull it back up, towards the, um, back, uh, kind of in between the Oregon, California border there, but still on the Oregon side. So this is part of where these earthquakes happened. And we have you on here to talk about that. So can you maybe give us a little bit more of a description of what exactly occurred here with these? Okay. Last night, there was a magnitude 5.7 earthquake um, offshore and um, pretty far off. So really no one probably should have felt it, but it happened in a little plate called the, the Gorda Plate. So we all know about the big Cascadia subduction zone, the big one, and that's actually, those would be earthquakes further to the east. Um, this is a little plate that's to the west of that. Um, there's a little spreading ridge where the plates are kind of coming together or coming apart. And uh, this was just a little, well, little, a 5.7 earthquake that was just the plate kind of relaxing a little bit as it's coming apart, um, as it's being pushed and pulled a little bit. Um, it was pretty shallow. You know, the, got the standard depth of about um, six miles. And uh, it was followed actually by about eight other earthquakes in the same region, all bigger than magnitude 2.5. This how is not common? an uncommon area. <laughs> That's so. what I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, not an uncommon area then for earthquakes. Um, with a 5.7, it being that big, that does seem to stand out a little bit. Is that something that was unexpected to have one that big, or is that something that isn't that out of the ordinary? Right in that location, there were actually two magnitude 5.9 earthquakes in June of 2021. And I just think it's extra cool because they happened within 24 hours of each other. So it's an interesting little bit of trivia. But prior to that, there hadn't been a big earthquake bigger than, I think, 5.5 or 5 in the 20 years prior to that. So you met they... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Nope, it's okay. Zoom's okay. always hard. Um, that's you know th these are not unexpected, but they're not common either. They they show up when they want to. And you mentioned this isn't part of the Cascade Cascadia subduction zone. This is a different section there. That's where this is occurring. And um, and also just for so everybody knows, in case this is the, you're first hearing about this right now. Uh, just to clarify that, that this wasn't really felt on shore and there was no tsunami or anything like that. Um, but given that, you know, over these last, I guess, four years or so, three years or so, so we have the two 5.9s, 5, 5 now 5.7, does that pretend anything that could be happening with that area that we should be concerned with? No, it is, gives no, it, the only thing we can say is that there's a good chance in the next 24 hours of another small earthquake of you know, a three or a four. The, it's not impossible, but the odds of another magnitude five or six earthquake there are very small, but not totally impossible. And when you have an earthquake off of there, you know, we, we said it, it's not affected on shore. Does it affect anything in that area around where it happened, especially given that it was so shallow? No, it would not have really affected anything. Any any ships in the area? The, you know, I assume the the things on the ocean bottom would have felt a little tremble, but then they would have gone on with their their little lives. And um, and you mentioned you know nothing to be concerned with as far as these hap this happening, and this is something that 
that does occur up there. Um, could this have any effect or anything that could tie into the Cascadia subduction zone, which is off the Oregon coast? No, they are, it's a different fault system and it was, it's pretty small. So it, it would not have either added to the stress or taken away the stress of anything to the, the, the big fault itself. Okay, good. So, so that's, that's encouraging to know. Um, discussing just really quick the Cascadia subduction zone and, and for everybody you know, who's maybe unfamiliar with exactly what's going on there, can you just give us just an idea of that zone itself and where that sits off the Oregon coast? Sure thing. The Cascadia subduction zone runs from uh, around Eureka, California, all the way north up to about the southern end of Vancouver Island. It's uh, about 1,000 kilometers, 600 miles, and it is a place where two plates are coming together and one is being shoved under the other. And it's gotten kind of, it, it doesn't have a lot of earthquakes, um, but the plates are still pushing together, so that stress, that strain is building up. And back in the year 1700, there was a massive earthquake estimated to be at least a magnitude 9.0 that did occur and caused a lot of inundation of the coastline of Washington and Oregon. Um, there was actually some subsidence where some of the land right on the coast sank. Um, and of course, there would have been a large tsunami. Interestingly enough, we know a lot about this event because the tsunami reached Japan and is recorded in harbor records of different ports in Japan, which I just think is really cool trivia. That um, really is, yeah. It gives, mm -hmm. Um, something just useful, I think the earthquake that we just had is, is a really nice reminder of, of the, the potential of an earthquake that we have. Um, today is actually the 60th anniversary of the magnitude 9.2 earthquake in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, the Good Friday earthquake that was very devastating to Alaska right there. And then, of course, had a tsunami that reached many of the coastal areas in the, the United States and Hawaii. I, I didn't realize that was the 60 year anniversary of that. Yeah, and, and that earthquake in particular, for anybody who wants to do some research on that, I mean, that really did a lot of damage to Anchorage, Alaska in, in reaching here. So uh, thankfully this one, you know, that we have, that we just had and, and potentially, you know, maybe another one here in the next 24 hours or something is, I believe is what you were mentioning. Um, not something to be concerned with, but yes, a good reminder that we do live in a very highly active, or at least potentially active earthquake zone. Um, and to that extent, too, I just wanted to talk about your organization as well. So the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. Can you just give everybody a little bit of idea of what you do there in monitoring all of this activity? Sure thing. We are uh, based out of the University of Washington and the University of Oregon. And we actually have over 700 seismometers across both states. And we're monitoring for any kind of ground motion disturbance or volcanic disturbance. And we have a, a public website where people can see where the stations are and, and what our recent earthquakes are. And um, basically we're there to record and then let people know what's going on and, and talk to, to the news and share with the public. I, I love that you're doing that and, and keeping that monitoring going. You know, in the event of the big one, or the, the big earthquake, you know, as it's, as it's known here in the Northwest that could happen. With all of this monitoring, is there any chance that you would have any kind of pre-notification that this is going to, going to occur? So for the past several years now, we actually have had, we're not gonna know days or months in advance. Um, that kind of earthquake prediction is still not possible as much as we all wish it was. But we do have, for the past three years, we have earthquake early warning in California, Oregon, and Washington. And for an event like the big one, that could give you up to a minute or more of warning, which is enough time to put yourself in a safe position to turn off the stove. Um, there's a lot of automated actions currently in the works or already in the work to shut off water valves, to slow down trains, things that will make the recovery a lot safer after, you know, and reduce the damage when the waves come. Um, but this earthquake early warning is called Shake Alert, and it's currently available to everyone in these states right now on their cell phones. 
And so you could download an app for that? I, I'm assuming it's a ShakeAlert app? It's, there is, it's actually built in natively to Android phones. You automatically have it. Um, for Apple phones, there's an app called MyShake, M-Y-S-H-A-K-E, MyShake out of Berkeley, that uh, also works. These two ways will be a little faster. You'll also get a WIA notification of the wireless emergency system, like when you get a, uh, an amber alert or a silver alert. It'll be the same type of thing, and so all the phones will also get that. Uh, it just might be a couple seconds slower than the Android operating system or the MyShake app. Um, so that'll, and, and what, would, um, what would need to happen for you to send out one of those alerts? We would need for an earthquake to be felt by at least four seismic stations. It would have to it then get calculated on, and this is all within seconds. Um, the magnitude has to be at least 4.5. The region has to, people have to have feel it. So I think it has to have a, um, a felt index of, of a four. So for instance, this earthquake that happened yesterday, if it had been closer, then we might have actually had a shake alert message to that part of the uh, Oregon, California coast. But because no one would have felt it, there was no alert issued. Um, so it has to be big enough to be felt, um, has, and then um, has to be confirmed by at least four stations. So it's not just a, a truck going by or a quarry blast or something. Uh, I love that technology is allowing us to do that and have it, even that amount of notice, you know, to be able to, to, be able to have that uh, ability right there. Um, how important, and, you know, and I'll, I'll just ask you this last question just because I love technology and learning about this. How important is the use case of AI and, um, you know, generative learning when it comes to figuring out these certifications and pushing these out to people when it comes to earthquakes? So right now there's nothing in production that uses AI, but there's a lot of research into it, both from what can we do after the earthquake has been triggered, and then also in just, are there any ways we can identify that signal sooner? Um, but it's still all just research right now. Interesting. Well, I, I think everything that you do is interesting, actually, and I, I want to say thank you very much, Mouse Two, for for taking time here to talk to us and for doing what you do to monitor all of this and keep us all informed of what's going on. So the bottom line for everybody who's tuning in and just seeing this earthquake notification or uh, the, the earthquake lower third, um, nothing to worry about as far as what happened there with the ones off the Oregon coast, but always good to be aware of what could happen and that we do have active subduction zones going. Uh, all along that coast, so to be aware of what's going on there. So, uh, Mouse, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, and for everybody watching, again, this is Fox 12 Now, so we cover a wide range of topics here on this show. I encourage you to download our app, the Fox 12 Oregon app, on whatever app store you're on, whether that's Android or the Apple Store or uh, Fire TV, Roku, um, we're on Amazon TV, or I think I just said Fire TV. We're on, we're on all this stuff, so Apple TV as well. So you can definitely download that Fox 12 Oregon app and watch all of our Fox 12 Now segments there. But we'll sign off for right now. Thank you for joining us. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.